I'm going to introduce our speaker, Mike Foster, who's been a member of the Native Plant Society for some time, and I've gotten to know better in fairly recent years, but uh, Mike is a, uh, a videographer, and uh, he's been making videos about Sonora, Mexico, and Southern Arizona for the last uh, 15 years. And I've had the pleasure of seeing some of the videos that uh, he sent me, and boy, they are just amazing. They're works of art. But he's posted over 300 educational videos about the flora, fauna, and cultural history of the region. Much of his early work was done with the Friends of the San Pedro River. Now he works as the interpretive person for the Friends of the Huachuca Mountains at the Carr House Information Center uh, there on, um, in the Huachuca Mountains. Uh, he's done significant work for the El Pinacate and Sierra uh, Alamos Reserves in Sonora. And his work also appears on the Coronado National Memorial Park web pages in the US. He has lived in Bismarck for the last 36 years um, from where he launches his filming trips across the Southwest. So Mike tonight is gonna show us some of his his artwork here, some of his creations that uh, focus, I guess, mainly on plants, but I'm sure looking forward to this, Mike. Um, Mike also wanted me, and I sent this to everybody just with a reminder notice, um, that he has a, a link to his uh, plant video showcase, um, which we've listed there, and the, if you check your email, I sent that out this morning, uh, the link to his uh, video showcase, so you can check things there. And should you wish to contact Mike directly, I've also listed his, his email address. If you have questions or anything you'd like to follow up with. So Mike, thank you very much and let's get started. Okay, well, th thanks so much, uh, Doug. It's uh, great to have an audience of people who already like plants. Uh, there isn't that big of an audience of people who uh, want to see videos about uh, plants, but I imagine everybody here does, so that's that's a real good start. Um, I make uh, documentaries and travel logs, music videos, and fictional stories uh, about flora and fauna and uh, indigenous people. And uh, you know, plants. I so in the flora and fauna, it's uh, plants are one of the easiest things to do because unlike birds, you know, birds can get away from you, but plants. Uh, uh, always pose very easily, so I, I enjoy that. But I like plants uh, for um, many other reasons too, and you know, we can cover that um, a little bit later on. But um, so I, I'm currently working on uh, videos for the Southwest Wings, which will be in May, their spring fling. And so I've done a number of podcasts, and then I'm doing the main video, which is on small creatures. And then I've, in the past, I've done a lot of videos for the Friends of the San Pedro River. And of course, for the Friends of the Pachuca Mountains, where I work Saturdays and Sundays at the car house. And so if you actually want to come out and see me, that's a great place to see me is at the car house up on Car Canyon Road in the Pachuca Mountains. Uh, so please come. We only get about 30 visitors a day and I can uh, show the videos there. Uh, we'll be going back into the house as soon as the virus is more under control. Um, but I, I like doing videos uh, that include uh, people in the area. Um, some of the people who have helped me in the past are here, and um, it's it's so nice to to cover those people. I, I know that uh, Mimi and Cato and Kat, Catherine Callingham and uh, Sky and a number of the other people have uh, have helped me. Um, so <clears throat> some of the things, some of the place, other places that I've done work for. Um, I would call it work, but I, I just go and, and help them out, do videos. I stayed at the Edward S. George Reserve in Michigan, uh, the University of Michigan, and helped uh, Robin, the director there, and do a video. And then did another video with uh, uh, Tony Reznicek, who um, you, you will see that a little bit later. I'm not going to show the video, but I will show you where the video is in case you want to see it. And uh, Boyce Thompson Arboretum, and then I've done a lot of videos with the Curanderos, 
curanderos down in uh, Mexico, uh, Don Zenaido, Cornelia, Don Juan, Orata, Mercedes, Herlinda. Uh, so, um, oh, and then uh, Allison, I think, might be here. Allison Torba also has helped me. I do some audio work on some of my videos. So um, of my videos, one of them has been the most successful. It's the uh, largest cactus in the world. And uh, for some reason on that one, I got 158,000 views. But a lot of them I just don't promote like other people promote videos. Occasionally I'll put them on Facebook. And since I really don't have a big Facebook presence, I don't get many hits, but um, I just like making the videos. So I, I'm not so much into promoting them. Uh, you know, which is maybe a shame, but we only have so much time. Uh, and I like the Zoom, you know, the, Zooms, the Zoom uh, uh, conference that we're having here and that we're going to have at um, Southwest Wings enables me to present my videos to a bit of an audience and get some reactions. Because a lot of times when you post videos online, uh, people just consider them videos and they don't think they need to respond. And that's okay, but I, I really enjoy when people, you know, write me a little note, you know, even if it's just three words, hey, that was a great video or whatever. Um, and if they write more, that's even better. Uh, so uh, I've included a link and uh, I think Doug sent it to everybody who's attending. And that link has all the videos that relate to uh, plants. And there are about 75 videos on there. A couple appear twice because I do subtitles on some of them. Uh, Occasionally, I'm in the uh, Alamos Film Festival, and the audience needs to be able to see it in both languages. So sometimes I do uh, subtitles, and I think I'm uh, getting better at the subtitles. But um, if you uh, take a look at that at home, you can look into any of the videos a little further if you want. So, so these are the videos that you'll see, and uh, we'll look at some of the first ones here. But uh, one of the more recent, recent ones I did was about columnar cactus from the desert to the jungle. And so that's starting up in here in Arizona and going down to uh, Sinaloa and to the bottom of the state of Sinaloa and maybe even to Nayarit, I can't remember exactly. And then I did one recently with a woman from Sierra Vista, Angeles Emery, and she's from the Valle de Tehuacan. And so I took her out, uh, she and her husband, and we went out and collected cactus fruit this summer. And uh, she showed how you can uh, uh, use the, cact the, uh, the saguaro fruit. And then we went to Boyce Thompson and found some of the other cactus that are common down in the Valle de Tehuacan. And we talked about those. And we'll see the story of Red Wolf. That's a story I just created. We'll see that soon. And uh, you can see many others there. Uh, Skyland Companions about the Apache Pine in this atoll. And, and you can see the Michigan ones, the one with um, Tony there, the uh, plastic nature of plants, I really liked because he uh, he knows what he's talking about. I'm a videographer and I think I know some things about plants, but uh, Tony has worked uh, uh, with plants forever. He's a botanist at the University of Michigan. And he, we were talking about how plants um, have a wide range and at the other end of the range, they might have some different traits, some plastic traits, and then they might split off into different species and how uh, the history of a plant, uh, in the history of a plant, uh, in isolation, they then become different species. And I thought it was uh, an interesting video. And then with, with Robin, I did the uh, three Michigan vines and she's the director of the George Reserve. So I love going back to Michigan. That's where I'm from. Uh, so it was great to get back there and film some of the, uh, the, the plants, the flora and the fauna. And then down below, you see some of the uh, Corinderos, Mercedes and Don Zenaido, Erlinda. And I did one with uh, Mimi Camp about the Salco, the um, uh, desert elderberry, and how that can be used medicinally. Uh, one on the Huareque, uh, a vine that you find down in the southern part of Sonora, the Ayal. There's one of those growing on the U of A campus, and uh, the Awama. And then uh, don't forget to click on the lo load more, and you can uh, see a whole other set of videos if it's going to respond. And so there's, a, there's actually 73. So I like to go and uh, do the cactus harvest each year. And it's, you know, it's miserable. It's about like this year, it was about 109 when I was out doing the cactus harvest. And I love to um, uh, try the um, pitayas, the um, steno, Stenocerus thurberi. So I, I went to the uh, Autumn Reservation down there at uh, 
uh, Quito Bac, not Quito, but Quito, but Quito Bac in Mexico. And I filmed the autumn people uh, harvesting and eating the cactus. And one on the um, uh, wheat lacochi, the fungus that's on corn, uh, one on the three sisters, corn bean and squash, madrone, and then how to eat uh, uh, choya buds. I always wondered how to do that. You know, it's, they look so horrible, you know, the cane choya, not the cane choya, but the um, staghorn and the buckthorn choyas. The spines just look absolutely horrible, but uh, I, did a video with Jesus Garcia from the Desert Museum and he showed me how to get the spines off very easily within 20 minutes, I mean 20, 20 seconds, and then put them in your mouth and eat them. And uh, I was amazed. And of course the often people do that, they'll uh, blanch them, then dry them and then rehydrate them later and use them a year later. So as you can see, I cover a lot about uh, agaves, some about mushrooms, walnuts, prickly pears, manzanita. But instead of uh, talking endlessly about that, I'm gonna change the screen here so that we can actually look at one of the videos. So I'm gonna, the first one I'm gonna show, I like to make uh, fun videos. I just like to have a good time with plants. And so this first one, I had a blast making. It's uh, kind of the telling of the story of La Llorona, the crying woman, which is a, a famous story down in Mexico, a precautionary tale. Uh, the parents will tell it to their children so they won't go into the wash and get bit by a snake or washed, washed away in a flash flood. And so this is a, a very short video. It's about three minutes and it's uh, my, my version of Mala Mujer. In the dry Sonoran hills that once were old Mexico, you will find a plant by the name of Mala Mujer also known as the bad woman. Mala Mujer is a stinging nettle that reaches out and grabs those that dare to go into the desert hills on a summer day. In the Malamuher plant lives the soul of a tortured woman who committed a horrible crime against her own family. Go get water from the well, I don't care what you do. I can't just pull water out of the air. To spite her husband, the Malamuher drowned their only two children in a flooded river of mud. <laughs> Regretting what she has done for eternity, she emerges from the plant during her most mournful time and roams among the arroyos, wailing. Today, children may hear her wailing if they go out to play, especially on monsoon afternoons. And if they are wise, they will leave the arroyo at once and return only after the summer is over. <laughs> Does anybody have any uh, comments uh, or questions about that? <laughs> that was scary. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I <laughs> hope I didn't scare anybody too bad. Just oh, wanted uh, to say there's another plant called Buena Mujer. And it's one that when you go out walking, it sticks on your clothes. And it's, uh, I guess, a good woman will stick to you like that plant. 
Oh, now I'm going to have to do a video on that. But it doesn't have stingy nettle stuck with it. Oh, doggone it. <laughs> well, Cole, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I like to get actors. It's, it's a little bit difficult getting actors. Um, I can control how quickly I do a video if I don't involve other people. But of course, it's more fun when you get other people. So I'm always up to that and if, uh, up for that. If anybody has any ideas, I, you can pitch them to me. And, you know, who knows? I, you can only do so many videos, but I always like to hear what people's I ideas are or if anybody volunteers to act or participate uh, in a video some other way. Sky here, I, I have a question. Is that a traditional story or is that something came out of your head? Well, it's uh, my version of that story. So, you know, I, uh, it, it's, it's told all over Mexico to my knowledge. Wouldn't you think so, Catherine? Yeah, yes. Uh, my question is, where did you get the children shots? Those are awfully sweet. And then in the altars to the children too. Uh, well, I was lucky. I was working at the schools and I had some friends and uh, they asked various people and they brought in their kids. And I'd love to do that nice. again. It's so much yes. better to have, so rewarding to have uh, kids in there. And then everybody loves seeing themselves on videos. Bobby was saying she wanted to hear La Llorona, but that was... I, you have another video for that or something. I don't I actually, know. I actually do. Yeah, I've uh, written to, uh, who is that guy? I wrote to a famous artist. I can't think of his name right now. Uh, and he let me use his song. So, you know, that's a nice thing. Artists will let you use their songs because they, uh, if people like the video, then they want to buy the song. So uh, you used to think in the past that you couldn't use a song because of copyright violations. But now it turns out that a lot of artists, not all of them, but a lot of them, like you to use their song. Uh, and I always write to them to try to get permission. So the next one is a story that I, uh, I, I wrote and it, it was based on something that I saw when I was a kid. Uh, we used to get, go down in the boiler room and we'd watch these videos. I, worked, I uh, was at a school that was ex an experimental school and they were very liberal, they'd let us do things. And so they'd give us a projector, we go into the boiler room and I'd put on this video uh, that was about um, how the loon got its necklace. So I tried to recreate that, but I tried to create it with the masks that I uh, was able to film and photograph down in Mexico. So this is kind of like the uh, Mexican version of how the loon got its necklace. And Allison uh, cr uh, created some of the audio in here. You'll hear her singing and doing some of the witch calls. And I think that really was uh, a, gr a great addition to this. Uh, video, so let's play that right now. In the high mountains, rising out of the deserts, Many tribes lived in harmony for years and years. One tribe that became too big blindly followed a treacherous leader. They destroyed much of their environment with their greed and ignorance. The other tribes and wildlife all suffered. Over the mountains, on the banks of the Black River, Red Wolf, son of Wolf, was coming of age. Someone from the tribe needed to preserve their race and their ways. It was determined that Red Wolf take off on a pilgrimage when the autumn moon rose above the lake. His path led down from the high mountains to the low deserts, where he would try to locate the poison bushes inhabited by the spirits of old witches. You couldn't just walk on the car. Ha! <laughs> na, 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 na. The sap of this bush could give his arrows more power. He left his mountain home, accompanied by only songs that described the mountains, lakes, 
rivers and valleys, leading him to where he needed to go. There was another song that told of the changing family of plants along the way. After many days, he arrived where the weather was warm. There, where the cactus grew, the old witches called to him from the red bushes. Is that? Is that where that? He begged them for power, and after three nights under the red skies, they granted him the power of the poison so he could go back and protect his people. He tipped his arrows in the poison and started on his trip back to his mountain home. On his way, he passed through the lands of a tribe of peaceful people that lived humble lives, not asking for much. Their chief persuaded Red Wolf to hide in their mountain canyons where the red trees grew because more and more tribes were overtaking the lands and ruining the environment. The chief said that Red Wolf's tribe had disappeared up into the mountains to protect themselves. Red Wolf decided to go up into the Red Tree Canyons, and the first night he had the most powerful dreams. A spirit appeared to him, and told him that he could live there, and the red in the trees would hold the memory of his race and the animals his people lived with. There, in the canyons, the seasons would never change. The tribes of the valley that took too much would rise and fall like the thunderclouds of summer, but up in the Red Tree Mountains, Red Wolf could preserve his people's customs. He would wait until the time was right to reunite with his own tribe and restore their ways of life. To this day, Red Wolf still stays in the mountain canyons and highest peaks waiting for the northern winds to bring back the rain and snow, to regenerate the trees and the animals his people love. At times, when the spirits are most alive, you can see where he stays waiting. When the force of his ancestors in their graves grows strong, the mountaintop begins to glow red. Today, it is said that if a bear comes out of the wild and passes through the streets of the mountain town, it will be a sign that harmony will come again. The forests will regenerate. Then Red Wolf can descend the Red Tree Mountains to search for his tribe, protected by the power of his poison arrows. He will go back to the place where he first set eyes on the world, to be there as the souls of the plants come back to life once again.
Well, it gave me something to do when I was up in the mountains anyways. I was just wondering if you might make a comment about the museum where those masks came from. That oh yeah, that's in, uh, it's in Echehoa, isn't it? Isn't that yes. the name of the town, Echehoa? So uh, Catherine Callingham uh, has a house in Alamos and uh, I visit there. And um, then we take these little trips sometimes and we went to the museum. What's the name of the museum, do you know? But it, 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 it's named after the gentleman who collected everything and he's passed away and there are some lovely young curators there now. Oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna remember his name. His, his name was uh, Jose Hill. Yeah, the young curators. And he's uh, a man. It's a world-class collection, just incredible of uh, masks from all over Mexico. And it's a toy museum. Um, but th those are other, it's like seven galleries and that's one of the mass galleries. Incredible. Yeah, it's really, really worth uh, visiting. Yeah, mass from all over Mexico and it's in the middle of nowhere. It just looks like a house hmm. and the parking isn't all that good. But when you go in, it's a fabulous place. And I thought, what a great opportunity, you know, so visually stimulating to see all those masks and to tie it in with the plants. And that was filmed in the White Mountains and then down in Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument. So it's an Arizona video. That was uh, just really beautiful, Mike. Was were some of those um, scenes with the maples in the canyons? Was that in the Huachucas or? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, it looked like Garden Canyon maybe or somewhere. And then the white mountains were pretty obvious. But yeah, gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're so lucky to have those canyons in the Huachucas. You're not kidding. <laughs> Garden Canyon's one of the best. Miller Canyon's good. Right. So if there are no other, no other questions, I'm gonna go on to the next video. And I'm just gonna show a bit of this one because you know we only have so much time. For making baskets, this variety is more likely to be found growing in gardens. It was selectively bred for its extra long dark pod and its ease of cultivation. It is the only variety with white seeds and it will germinate more reliably. The long dark fibers play an important role depicting figures and designs against the lighter colors of the baskets. The autumn weave using natural colors. Bear grass and yucca are two long-leaved plants that are used in the foundations. Here on the pale yucca background, the dark devil's claw fibers have the honor of representing mankind and the world through which he must navigate. This man in the maze represents the journey people of the autumn tribe make as they evolve through their lives. Another variety of devil. I'll just go to the end of the that movie. attaches itself to our lives and becomes part of our strange human dramas. Wow. So I just wanted to show a bit of that. And I, I just love the Devil's Clyde always thought that name just begged to have a video made about it. Um, anytime you can bring the devil into a plant, uh, it's it's always, it, it would be interesting. So uh, any questions about that? Nice, Mike. <laughs> Thanks. I love the mask at the end. Uh, that's again, at uh, is that at Echehoa? Is it? I think that's Echehoa, yeah. Which is right down at the bottom of the state of Sonora. They have a um, Festival de Tres Torres, is that what they call it? Uh, but there, it's, it's like a powwow and all the different uh, groups come from the Wadahios to the Mayos, to the Yaquis, to the Autumn, to Tarahumara. Um, 
anyways, so um, we can move on to the next one unless anybody has any questions about that. Oh, the, that, that by the way was uh, Cato's um, long pod devil claw. I was looking all over for it and I forget how I found out Cato, but I uh, went to your place and you had the long one growing and uh, so you're I, got, I, I got it from Petey Moschini. Oh, you got it from Petey Moschini? Yeah, unfortunately it's an annual. And so I don't, it's not popping its head up again from the seeds. So that's too bad. I wanted to say, Mike, that that was such a tease. That was just a wonderful video. And, and I really love that you're pulling a indigenous um, energy into the plants um, because, you know, there's just such a history to those plants with um, the people who have been here for so long. Yeah, I love that too. That's, I, and I know you go down to Mexico as well. And when you go down there, and a number of us do um, go down to Mexico. And when you go down there, I'm always impressed with just how much more connected people are, you know, especially the indigenous people in the rural areas. They can tell you all kinds of things about the plants. And, you know, that's something that kind of is missing from our culture. We live such a modern uh, life that, you know, we don't connect with the, with the earth as much as we could, which is a nice thing about plants is, you know, when you look at a plant growing in the earth, it kind of draws you into it with its complexity and um, brings you back into the earth, makes you, it gives you a better sense of, uh, of, you know, who we are and where we belong. So the next video I have, I think is about that. Uh, this is a, a, a man in Alamos uh, who uh, takes me on hikes and it's good to know somebody when you're hiking around. Um, he's a wonderful guy, uh, Rafael Figueroa. Um, I just love this guy. He's such a, a wonderful spirit to go hiking with. Who knows what is out here in these tropical deciduous forests? We never see most of what a beekeeper sees when he is hiking through the mountains. He can't turn around and tell us to look because he almost always travels alone on foot. Practically no one could keep up with him anyways. Other than pausing for lunch, he hikes all day long, often starting before dawn and returning at dusk. The honey and the plants he collects are off the trails in places that perhaps only he can find. Rafael told me that in between the two halves of the Sierra Alamos, there is a giant yucca, and that it is the only yucca of its kind that he has ever seen. Twice I hiked all day with Rafael to find this yucca, but it was too far and too hidden in his memory. This last year, again we tried to find it. In the morning, we started from La Aduana, following the main arroyo past large evergreen figs and spiny pichote, or kapok trees. Later, on a trail, we ascended into the mountains through thick forests of echos, a columnar cactus that grows from southern Sonora on southward. Other cactus in the tropical deciduous forest are the sawira and the viejito, or the old man bearded cactus. As we came to the ridge, the vegetation began to change from the Monte Mojino, or maroon gray colored tropical vegetation, into the highland plant species. Here, tree morning glories that the bees pollinate and whose flowers deer love to eat mix with the large leafed oaks such as the cacachila and the cuchi. The oak groves or bosques then become solid and dense as we approach the peaks. Strangely enough, the occasional tropical palms also begin to peer on the cool rock cliffs. As we rounded the bend, to my amazement, a small forest of grass trees, or the Nolina matopensis, appeared on the hill. From here, the grass tree forest 
looked down on the Sea of Cortez to the west and the Sierra Madre Mountains to the east. These trees had survived hurricanes that have blown in from the south, such as Norbert, that rained 18 inches in one day and flooded the towns below. One tree that Raphael was sure to show me was the chilicote, with its interesting bark and its colorful seeds that were used in artisan work in town. Another very useful plant is the agave lechuguilla. This is distilled in local distilleries near La Duana. In the winter, these tropical deciduous forests begin to flower. When there is enough rains, both the lavender and the yellow forms will come out. The palo barrio, with its larger yellow flowers, bloom at this time as well. Coas, or trogons, orioles, or orioles, cordornices, or quails, and parrots are some of the birds along the way. In these forests, where the trees are taller than the cactus, Vishnaga, barrel cactus, and small mammillaria cactus can be plentiful as they take advantage of any open space. The spiny bromeliads attach to rock outcroppings as well, as do the resurrection fern. Ascending back into the cooler air of the high oak forests or bosques, I was struck by how much it resembled the Madrean woodlands of the Huachuca Mountains, where I lived in southeastern Arizona. The woods were thick and shady, and an understory of herbaceous plants and grasses grew. Here the rains were heavier and more frequent than below. The hilltops became more and more visible as we neared where Raphael believed the giant solitary yucca to be. This place was distant in a full day's hike. Should we find the great yucca, we could not stay long or risk having to hike back in the dark. This was our third time searching for the yucca and Raphael was determined to find it no matter how tired we were. Finally, on a very high ridge, we came upon the great yucca. Estas rocas le ayudaron mucho a, a que sobrevivieran. We are here in the Aduana Mountains. Up ahead is Tepehuaje Mocho, and after that is the Valley of the Magnolias, and then the road from Uvalama. Yuca, 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 la yuca. Ah, ah, la yuca, ah, ah, la yuca en la sierra. Fa, 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 fa. Muy bien. <laughs> I have never seen a person so thrilled about a plant in my life. However, of all the things that captivate people, I have to say that this love of nature is certainly the closest to my own passions. It is most certainly a good thing to be able to see and appreciate the miracles of the life force, even in a plant. A plant whose health gives us excitement and appreciation and a desire to help it along however we can.
Mi nombre es Rafael Figueroa Castro. Toda mi vida me ha gustado caminar en la sierra, caminar en los montes. I am Rafael Figueroa Castro. All my life I have walked in the mountains, surrounded by rocks and trees, and sometimes friends from other places. Now I am old, but that doesn't matter. The countryside is even older than me. That day, as we descended the Sierra, through the grass tree and oak forest, we both felt satisfied to have been with this great solitary plant on its perch, overlooking this strange, tropical, Madrean land. To your health, from here in Alamo, Sonora, from the mountains, from me, Rafael Figueroa. Nativo. I just love Rafael. He's such a wonderful guy. And to see him get that excited <laughs> about a plant, it really made me feel good. <laughs> Any, okay, uh, so Mike, what was the plant? Was uh, the I don't know. I don't know, you know. So ours is, um, the uh, yucca shatai is the closest one that we have in this area, right? And then don't some people now call it, uh, the one in the Huachuca is the uh, yucca madrensis or something. Yeah, it was enormous. This one was much bigger and it's got to be something and I since it was the only one that he'd found in the mountains and he hikes all over the mountains I have no idea what it was or how it got there. Did, did a bird bring the seed? How did it get there? Um, I, I wish I could figure out what chuck it is. If anybody finds out please let me know <laughs> or knows how to find out. But those are some beautiful mountains there. This yeah. year, almost. It was and really then, wonderful to have you take us to places that many of us will probably never be, but that we got as though we were walking with you. So that I really appreciate. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Do you make a point of learning the plant name in Spanish and English, or like, why do you challenge yourself to know it in both languages? Or do you find a value in that? Or do you just do it because you're interested? Or like, I mean, it just, it's impressive that you know the name of the plants in Spanish and in English. Well, I love uh, learning those names. I, I just, you know, they're, they're so interesting because a lot of those names are indigenous names. And so you're not speaking Spanish, you're, you're speaking uh, maybe oh. Guadalajara and, you know, I, I, and those names, you know, Cacachila, Cuchi, you know, all those names are, yeah. I, I love the animals, like the, um, the opossum is the Tlacuachi, and the, uh, <laughs> the ringtail is the Cacomixtle, and the, uh, <laughs> I think the raccoon oh. is the Mapachi, and the uh, yeah, yeah. is the uh, Chalugo. Lugo. And so to be able I noticed to... that I noticed how musical the names were. Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, so no, I do. I, you know, when I talk to uh, Raphael, um, I really make an attempt to learn them. And uh, unfortunately, I can't get back often enough to solidify all that. But but a number of them, you know, like the Pichote and or the different uh, terro Torotes, which are the uh, Berseras, the elephant trees. Um, I remember some of those, you know, like the um, uh, the gumbo limbo tree. They have a name for that. I can't think of it right now. And then they have the copal, torote copal, which is an incense. And um, oh, just a, a whole bunch of wonderful names. Nice. So this next one, I, I think you'll all love because it's the same kind of uh, video. It's about the Wadahios and the Wadahios are the most recently um, acknowledged, I guess is the way to say it, uh, indigenous group in Mexico. Uh, from they're, they're kind of a cross between the Tarahumara and the Mayos. And uh, this is a woman who's a curandera, uh, who takes care of everything in their little village. Uh, and she's a wonderful woman that I've known for years. Her name is um, 
uh, Cornelia. So. In the hills of southern Sonora, along the Rio Mayo, is the Guadajillo village of Mesa, Colorado, where Cornelia and her husband Ramon live. These two have spent their lives using the plants from the environment as food and medicine. They are the curanderos that other people in the community come to, to be treated for illness. Fresh traditional cures acquired directly from the environment are a clean, healthy part of life here, far away from the rest of the world. Many of their most useful plants are grown in their garden or maintained as trees around their house. This way, these common medicines are always ready for use. Other medicines can be gathered in nature from the hills and valleys around town. Modern medicines from pharmacies are not always available or even needed here. The way Cornelia and Ramon use plants to cure people is both handed down and original. Plant names and the way plants are used may differ from curandero to curandero and from town to town. The treatment of patients at times have to do with removing spells that have been cast. Treatments usually include cleaning away these bad spirits and promoting luck or positive attitude with herbs that clean. The cilantro is primarily grown as an herb to give more flavor to beans and meat. However, Ramon says you can boil the root of the cilantro and make a tea that helps irritated eyes. A little weed growing everywhere, known as cardo, is good for the eye, too. Cornelia showed me that if you break off a leaf at the base, a thick yellow juice comes out, and that can be applied to a red eye. The fresh, immature leaves of the prickly pear are commonly eaten like a vegetable. These leaves are good for people with diabetes. The chiltepine is the original wild chili that other chilies were developed from. It is one of the hottest. Cornelia uses it to spice up their food. She and Ramon told me that a tea made from the root is good to take care of aches around your waist, including stomach pains. Ramon then told me that the root also helped people rise up out of unhealthy, lingering conditions. The albahaca, or basil, is used to clean away bad energy, such as nervousness and stress, that make people vulnerable. Cornelia also said basil mixed with avocado seed will help people sleep better. Marijuana is used for rheumatism. Steeped in alcohol and applied to the inflamed areas, the marijuana will reduce swelling and pain. <laughs> the guayacan is a tree that really stands out when it flowers and becomes almost completely blue. Its bark can be broken up into a few small pieces and made into a tea that is good for the lungs and the heart. Corazón. Sí. Corazón y pulmones. Sí, pulmones. Okay, ¿cuáles son los dos? Sí, los dos juntos. ¿Qué es este? Cornelia uses lichen from the rocks and gordo lobo together in a tea 
to alleviate the back pains that make people feel uncomfortable when they walk. This tea may also be used to help kidney or stomach pains, as well as the flu. The root of chicora, a plant that is common in dry arroyos, is very good for fixing pains in the chest, and it is excellent for curing cancer. La raíz de chicura. Raimundo, a Mayo man from a nearby community, is standing in front of a chicura plant. Huitehui. Huitehui. Sí. Es muy bueno para cáncer a todo en edad muy bueno este. This plant is good for all kinds of things, including cancer. Huitehui, as she calls it, goes good with Gordo Lobo and Chicura. Oh, Salvia. Sí. In Water Hill? Water Hill, we we know. We we know. Hey, we know. Hey. ¿Y cómo puede usar we we know? Puede tomar también. Cocido. This thin branch is from the salvia. Guardo Lobo and Chicora and salvia are mixed together to make a remedy for the cough. ¿Cómo puede usar la banana? Bueno, no Bananas also grow in the yard. They, however, are only used for their edible fruit. No. Uh. Sí, este sí. Yes. The pomegranate they call granada is not only a good fruit, but its root is a good medicine used to cure diarrhea, especially for people that come here from other areas. It is good tasting, and it also helps with tonsillitis. Hervido in tea? Sí, te. Una taza? Sí, una taza. No está amargo, muy bueno. Puro agua. Sí, nosotros sí tomamos cuando teníamos. Three of these fresh leaves from the guava tree behind Cornelia can be made into a tea to help children stop vomiting when they are very sick. Sometimes she adds a little fennel to this tea. Remedio. Mucho. O sea, le cocimos, le clavo, clavo con canela. Lo echamos esta. The fresh mango leaves, clavillo, and cinnamon are made into a tea to alleviate a cough. Sí. Fresca. Oja sí. fresca. Oja fresca. Sí. Guarijiva, así se llama. When a person has inflammation or swelling of the skin, the aloe vera leaf is very helpful. The salted leaf should be held in place over the area with a piece of cloth. Cooked leaves are also good for diabetes. Guarajillos call aloe corazapari. The oil of the iguana in this jar can be used for children that have tonsillitis. There are two types of iguanas. The one that lives in the tree is the one that must be used. The other iguana lives underneath rocks. Cornelia says winter is the best time to kill the iguanas after they have become fat, eating a local flower. Tiene mucha manteca. Eh, come pura flores. Sí, este con el diablo. Ese es muy bueno para picar animal. Eh, venenoso. Se pica una chamaco chiquito. In her right hand, Cornelia has cola de diablo, or tail of the devil. It is a good treatment for venomous animal bites, especially for little children. A tea made of this long root is used to wash the bite area. Also, the tea can be drunk or the root chewed to reduce fever. In Cornelia's left hand is Damiana, an herb you take after you lie down. It tastes good and is good for all kinds of conditions. <laughs> This is the root of an aster called pinchon 
that is used to treat waist pain, ulcers, the inability to urinate, and impacted bowels. With modern medicines, it isn't very easy to know where they came from or how they were produced. In this place, far away in the Sonoran Desert, medicines are living organisms that get planted and tended and are watched as they grow. Here, people and plants have been together from the beginning. The environment isn't separate from the people. It is part of them. And those that have learned its secrets have a very special place in this community that still is connected to its land. Oh, uh, it's, it's nice to see. Uh, she looked like a pretty happy woman to me. You, you, you captured her beautifully, Mike. Thank you. And that's one of the things I love is on indigenous people's faces, you can see the environment. You can you know, see how they've been outdoors all the time and they've been dealing with the plants and that wonderful weathered look and their clothing. And, um, you know, they choose their clothing pretty well too. You know, I, you know, most guys, we don't really think too much about you know how we look but the guys down there they wear these this old looking clothing but it's pretty it's it's chosen in a um their choices are, are are nice in my mind the colors that they choose are are very nice i think the I lady do. is a national treasure oh. <laughs> i do <laughs> allison i was wondering what your perception of was she smiling and laughing all the time or was she self-conscious because you were videoing her no was she, she, what was she like with the camera no she's a she's a natural in front of the camera that's the way she is wouldn't you agree Ka uh, Catherine? yeah yeah she's that way and uh that, that was a nice thing about her you know you point the camera at a lot of different people and you find out who's uh who's going to tolerate it and who isn't but yeah she, she didn't skip a beat and she's like that because I think she's happy and and very self-assured. She seemed natural really, leaders. She seemed to really be smiling when her husband brought up marijuana and alcohol. She got a big. big <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like really just topical, huh? Oh. <laughs> uh, and the the Damiana too has a pretty distinct uh, effect. I don't know if anybody has. Uh, Use the tea of Damiana, but that has a pretty distinct effect. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Mike. It was great. I just uh, really, what a treat. I hope you do another event like this. This is wonderful. Okay. Well, gosh, Mike, that was, that was really nice. Certainly uh, a departure from many of the presentations we've had in the past, but it was very, very interesting. And what a great opportunity we have to look at these on our own from um, checking your website there and so forth. So thank you again, Mike, very much. And thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone for attending tonight.